Yeah, my name is uh, Jochen. A little bit of my background, I started as a level designer, later on lead level designer, so I'm coming from the production side of games, not from the research side. When we did Settler 7 with Blue Byte, in the end we did many informal studies, which were not that good, but we have seen that we could use this uh, methodology to get better games, and I was offered the opportunity to build up a game slab from the scratch or user research facility. And um, since then, I did many advanced trainings, like the Usability Week by Niels Norm Group. Um, I'm a certified user experience manager from a drum uh, government, and yeah, I did many lectures, uh, like IEEE conference keynotes, or at Hansel University of Applied Science, and many more. So let's imagine BI comes up to you with this. So we have a massive drop of players at level 10. But why is that? So we ask user support. And they say, I don't have any idea. Maybe QA does know something about it. No bugs. What's happening there? What can we do? We can lure the usual gamer to our facility and watch him play. Is it worthwhile? Maybe if we have a usual game. But if we have a long running game, we spend hours or even days watching and watching, doing them tedious tasks that are not worthwhile watching. So we throw money down the drain because we see happening nothing. So what can we do as well? We can cheat. Will it bring good insights? Maybe, but most of the time not because the people jump over a certain time and it's not played as intended. So, yes, it's not that costly, but it brings false data because we skip time. Is there a better way? There is. We can do diary studies. So, what are diary studies? It's exactly like you can see. This is the pointer. So, you have people writing down what they are doing. They are taking notes and they are sending them to you. Maybe not in this nice manner, but it's what it's done. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, why should you do diary studies? How could you do diary studies? There are as well some don'ts that you shouldn't do during diary studies and what results can you expect? So let's start with the why. So what is, a good, what is good with a long-term committed on a manageable base? People don't have to show up at your facility. So it's obvious people have a travel time from zero because they play at home or wherever they like to, and that makes people happy. And it gives you a bigger user day base because people don't have to show up, so you can have people that are not around your facility. You can ask people from all around the world doing diary studies for you. So testing times are much more flexible because they don't have to show up on a certain time because you say, we have our test at 9 p.m., you have to be there at 9 p.m. No, they don't and players put their playtime in their day-to-day -day activities. So there is an advantage up top, on top. You can anticipate certain user peaks because people are playing at that time or at this time. It's not that exact data which you will get from BI, but it's data that makes you give a feeling for your game times. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and short times interactions are much easier to handle. Think of a game that gives you a bonus each hour. You won't have people sitting in the studio watching them, how they use Facebook, how they surf in the internet or something like this. They just uh, put out their device and do a click and you will get data. And it's much easier and much more comfortable for them because they can do laundry, they can do gardening, they can do whatever they want in the meantime. And a big advantage is you have less costs. Why is that? You have less effort because you have uh, only to brief the people during Skype or during uh, via an email or something like this, but you don't have to set up your room several days in a row when people are at home, which makes it much easier. <coughs> less work equals less cost, which is good. And you have uh, more time with less support by your team, which 
is uh, giving you the advantage of only paying a relevant task by the players, not playing, not paying their whole time. And if you pay on our hourly base, you save a lot of money again. So we have one pro tip, pro tip why it's good to have it. We incentify these tests. Usually we don't incentify tests. We give away gifts. But these uh, tests are paid. And people tend to play much more than is incentivized. In our experience, people have a, an average of 50% more time that they're investing in a test. For sure, you have people that are only doing what is asked for, but you have people that are doing a lot more of time with and spending much more time with your games. And you can experience how players behave in the wild. They are sitting not in your studio, but they play in the surroundings they are used to. And this is really good because um, they are much uh, easier to handle. And you get feedback on things you could never test in your facility. Imagine a player who wants to play, let's say, Far Cry with a Guitar Hero controller. And there are people out there doing this. And you will never test this in, on your facility because people won't get these controllers, but they do. And uh, you have playing times that fit in the daily life of the people, which is uh, quite, quite good. So the players are more satisfied with the test setup, which is really, really important. The people are more happy with the playing. They are not more happy with the game, so you won't get better feedbacks in terms of ratings, which is something we didn't want, but you will get better feedback in terms of what is really happening. And uh, in-game or side communication is encouraged. Think of a test setup where you have eight people in a room and they're sitting side by side. What is going to happen? They turn around and ask, did you find this or that? They will never use a chat or they will never use uh, things like uh, TeamSpeak or stuff like this. They will talk in person. And this is a wasting time and this is a watering your results. So you can test how they communicate, and you can test what they com are communicating. For instance, if there is something that they don't understand, you will find out about that, and you can uh, talk to the team later on and say, there was a lot of talking about this topic. Maybe you should introduce it within your tutorial because people are not getting it right now. And the people have freedom, which is uh, really good because uh, people are <laughs> behaving more natural. And so you, give more, you get more realistic feedback. So how do you do diary studies? So what do you need? For sure, you need people playing your game because you want to get feedback. But you have to be really, really keen of uh, meeting your target group, even better than within a usual play test because uh, it's more effort in terms of organizing them and um, so you have, an, on top, to be aware, it's a long time commitment. Usually we do tests about two weeks, sometimes a little bit longer. And if you do that, people have to be sure to be able to play all the time. So there are two ways to have it. You should have a buffer on top. So if you want to address eight people, have, <coughs> let's say, 12. And we um, don't say you have to play from uh, January 1st to January 30th, but we ask them to play 32. 30 days with a buffer time, so people can say, I have a family event uh, in the midst of January, and then they can skip two days, but they send the same data because they spend the same time before the test. So then you should set up a documentation scheme. So which data is collected, how do you collect it, um, will you get emails, will you get Excel sheets, will you have an online survey? This is everything you should have thought about really upfront. So then uh, you should have a way of, for the version distribution. This is heavily depending on the game you're testing. If you're testing on iOS, you can use systems like TestFlight. If you're in a big studio and you have an alpha and beta rollout environment, you can use this. So just think about how will people get your version. And on top of that, think on how will people not leak information hopefully, but we have good experience with this so far. And what are your communication channels? 
I think it's really, really good to have Skype or something where you can talk with people in person. Why Skype? Why not, why not um, phone? Because you, have, can, you can have people w within a one Skype group and you can talk to them at the same time, which is giving you more time to do your study. So what do you do? You brief your participants. So usually we ask them for a Skype call at a certain time, talk with them, what is expected, what you have to do, how do we expect you to fill out our documentation, how will we get your information, and so on. Then you should have your meta documentation ready then. If you try to start this when you get the first data, you're in a mess because you will think, oh, how do I put it, and where do I put it, and so have it ready before you start your study. Then you send out an instruction mail. I know I've said to you, you brief the people, but people tend to forget. So if they have something they can rely to later on, they will have an easy way to know, oh, I have to put this there, I have to send the email there, whatever. And uh, a pro tip, if you brief the people, don't use data from your game. Because what's happening then? People are copycats. So they will see, oh, we had this example, and I will put it like that. And this will give you wrong data. So use an example from a game that you expect that most of the players have played. Let's say you are testing an MMO, use World of Warcraft. And um, it's much easier. People know what they have to do, but they don't know how to have to do it exactly. Then what do you need for the conduction? Still, you need your communication channel to receive all your data and information. So you need really an open mind and empathic skills. You are working with people, we are doing always, but it's slightly different because uh, you will experience people that are telling, oh, I broke up with my girlfriend yesterday, so I can't play today. And you have to handle this. And this is a really different to your usual studio setup because people in a group, and they don't tend to talk to you about things like this, but if you do it in your, within a diary study, they will, believe me. Then you need lots of time because you get really, really big amounts of data which you need and which you have to put in, in your documentation, which you have to refine because people tend to give answers that you not want to have in this format and stuff like this. And you should have a debrief. This is uh, the point where you will get information that people didn't share during the study because it was not asked for. You can have open interviews, you can have open questions, so you will get many informations on top. Do it again via Skype, is my recommendation. So what do you do? You track the players' efforts, put in the data, but uh, as well you look do they play or do they just copycat the results from the day yesterday? You can track um, if they played, if they have, have the opportunity. Yeah, and as I said, you have to pamper your participants. In terms of technical difficulties, in terms of personal difficulties, everything is going to happen. And then type in the data. Do it during the study. You don't want to do it after the study because, again, you will be in a mess with the amount of data. And on top of that, if you do it after the study, you, don't, you are not able to prepare your debrief correctly because you will take information from the players to ask questions during the debrief. And uh, another tip, what we are doing is we ask people for the three top emotions during their playtime. And it's not about that. We want to hear from the people, I am happy. Why are we doing it? Because it's a trigger point. People are set back from their usual gaming and they think about, oh, there was a time when I was angry and why is that? And then they start to give you a good insight what was happening there. And it's, so the emotions might be worthwhile having a look at, but it's much better to have a look at all the stuff they're writing why they had the emotion. And um, I have an appendix, uh, there is an example where you can have some uh, of the emotional tables we are using. And uh, believe me, you will get strange stuff if you don't have a list of emotions, because people think tired is an emotion. Uh, I don't think so, but they do. So, um, next step, reporting for sure. 
what do you need? You need all data. And by all data, I not only talking about the data you get from the players. If you're in the opportunity to have a BI department, ask them to track data for you during the test. This uh, makes it much easier for you and for the players. If you ask players to type in their level each day, it's error prone, you won't get all the data maybe, it's wrong, so if you have BI data, it's much easier to use this. Then um, you should have a decent reporting setup. So think of what are you going to report, how are you going to report it, what we make heavily use of are user stories because you have a, yeah, you have play time and you have a, a change over time, so it's good to have user stories, not only day by day or only issues or stuff like this. And again, you need time. You have large amounts of data, you have um, to consider how was, uh, how was it meant, was people, what people were writing, so take your time. Self-reported data is sometimes really, really tricky. Then what do you do? Uh, what I would recommend, start with the statistics. So it's uh, tedious monkey work and you get it out of your way. This is a not so good point. The good point is if you have your statistics, you have things that you know you could, should keep an eye on during your reporting. Then we set up our player stories. I will show you an example later on. And then really, really take your time to figure out what did player mean with a certain expression. So what you shouldn't do during diagnostic studies? Never, never ever underestimate a diary study. When we did the first diary study, it was such a pain in the ass and we really, we missed all deadlines that we agreed upon upfront. So this is really something you have to consider. And um, what we have experienced, if you have 12 people with an, for a diary study, we need a full man day to keep track of it. And consider you have weekend times, so you will have three days on Monday that you have to type in and so on. So it's not only one day per work day, but it's one day per day. So it leads to bad reports because you're in a mess, you want to catch up time, and you are not that good with your reports. So what you shouldn't underestimate are the pamper needs, which are taking time, which are taking your nerves at some, time, at some point, and um, all the stuff that might come on. Tech <coughs> difficulties, play difficulties, personal, personal difficulties. And you should have a proper resource allocation. So be sure you have people conducting the study all the time. And otherwise your reports are running late. You shouldn't forget things. So never forget BI and data tracking. As I said, it makes your work much easier. And missing information is not that likely to happen. So you should set up fallbacks for leaving people. As it's a long time commitment, people will leave, definitely. So have a good buffer, not only one or two people, usually I would recommend four to five people depending on the size of the study. Otherwise your study will fail. And uh, what we don't do are basket tests. I don't know if you are keen with basket tests. Basket tests is if you have a big group of users and you have microtransactions within the game, you put out in-game money and people are spending the money. If you do it correctly with BI, it's working, but it's never working with a diary study. It won't, believe me. So it leads to money spent completely different, be differently because people know we are two days, uh, two weeks doing a study and afterwards all my effort is raised, so it's gone. And people are, I like this uh, lilac sword, I will buy it. The stats are worse, and, but, but I will buy it because it's looking nice. I will never do it in the game if I play it really, but I will do it during the study. And what you think you could do, track how they spend it. Yeah, sure, you can, but it will give you really, really uh, wrong insights. And you will come to wrong assumptions. And what you can do on top, you can ask players, how would you spend money? And we have a saying in our office, um, 
Could you imagine stepping to the window and jump out? Sure, I can. Will I do? I will never. I won't jump out of the from the fourth floor. But people, if you ask them for assumed uh, behavior, they will assume everything. There's a nice uh, anecdote when Coca-Cola invented the new recipe for Coca-Cola. They did big user research, and one of the main questions was, could you imagine buying the new Coca-Cola? And they did. All people said, yeah, I can imagine to buy it. And they brought it to the market, and it failed. I think within three months, Coca-Cola brought the classic Coke on the market with the old recipe. And nowadays, we only have the classic Coke again. So don't ask people for their assumptions, because you will get wrong assumptions. And um, what we have a good experience with is um, we hand out money for a test. So we ask people, would you like to get, let's say, 10 pounds less for your test, but you can spend 20 pounds in the game? And this is working out, because people have the feeling they're spending their money. And um, you have a small user group, you don't have BI data, but you get a much better feeling if you do it like that. And which results can you expect? So let's come back to the player loss at level 10. What happened to it? Yeah, game design and project management weren't happy with this, obviously, <laughs> so they asked us, why is it happening? The I couldn't answer it, they only could show us the numbers. So what did we do? We did a diary study because it was on, I think, day five or something like this for Settlers uh, Online. And our foc one of our focal points were definitely level 10. What's happening there? What are people doing? And we did a proper setup, so we didn't ask the people, would you leave at level 10, or why would you leave at level 10, or something like this. But uh, we asked for the emotions, and we got a really good impression because people were angry. They were really, really angry at level 10. What was happening there? They um, get a new in-game uh, mechanic, and it was a military. And it was introduced with, this is a military, use it. <laughs> Which is not good, but we could uh, find out that we need more steps, and we mo need micro steps, and the game was really, really good change at that point, and we could get rid of this dip. And what you will get on top is structured data. I know some studios have BI data, and some studios have really good um, data visualization, but imagine small studios that don't have the opportunity. And you can ask people to do screenshots. So there's an example from um, Anno Online, and you will see how people build their uh, yeah, the settlement. And we had a big discussion with level design about this rocks, or these rocks because it was like, okay, it's an obstacle, maybe it's an opportunity to force players to do something, or maybe it's really annoying for the players. And we could find out they are easily playing around and it's not that big, uh, not that a big problem. So this is a usual player story that we are doing. So you can see all the time data, what's happening, how much time is spent in the game, um, how is, uh, this was for Assassin's Creed Identity, a mobile game on iOS. And we could find out how is the player progression, um, which missions are played. We could see this player was really, really happy with the game most of the time, but he hated to be forced to play the tutorial because he was an Assassin's Creed player. He was really, really... Uh, knowing the game and he didn't want to know how to jump or how to climb a building or stuff like this. And this gives a really good insight for the team. They know what's happening, how people are playing, how do they feel during their journey. And what is really nice, you will get much more than you asked for. I know this is looking a little bit like coder graphics, but it's uh, user graphics. And it was uh, a game called Might and Magic Heroes Online. And we never asked for the battle mechanics, but people were really analyzing it and saying, oh, flanking is not good with the setup. Maybe you could uh, change the level. And this is really nice because you get much more insights than you asked for. And on top of that, you will get feedback when the study is done. 
if the game is in beta status and you hand it out and people can play afterwards, they really send you emails. We get we got feedback half in half a year after study. So this is really something you get benefit on top that you're not paying for. So that's my short introduction to diverse studies. Is this working? Yeah, it's working. Hello. Uh, I'm going to just touch on something which you kind of skimmed over. You mentioned that you run diary studies with just 12 people. Sorry, and I mentioned what? You, you mentioned that you run diary studies with just 12 people, and I'm using just in inverted commas here. Um, can you hear me? Uh, not really. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll try and speak up. How about now? Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. What... Um, do you get any pushback when you, you run a diary study with quite small numbers, like the 12 players that you mentioned during this talk? Or do you find that your developers are happy with those smaller numbers? Happy with what? Uh, do you need to justify uh, running a diary study with such small numbers as, as 12? Or do you feel like the developers are happy with, with a very small number of players? Do, Basically, do you, do you often get questions of people going, why only 12? So, so you are talking about the amount of players, did I get it right? Yes. Uh, as, it, uh, as it's qualitative research, it's okay. We are not doing quantitative research. We would hand over to BI for that. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, make clear upfront what we can do and what we can achieve, but then it's okay with the teams, yes. Okay, cool. Hi, um, I just had a quick question. Maybe a couple other people were wondering this as well. Uh, you said it's much cheaper to run a study like this. I was just curious as to what the approximate costs are that you look at for per player. You want to hear about the costs? My boss is gonna hit me if I can tell you about <laughs> that. But what I can say, uh, let's assume you would have uh, people sitting in your studio for two weeks. We assume um, an observer for one to two persons, depending on the system. If we have handhelds, we have one person sitting by one person. So if we have 12 players sitting there um, 10 days, we have 120 man days. And if you assume only for observing, so you have a factor from about four to five times because uh, we cut out all the preparation, all the reporting stuff, but I think it's uh, four to five times more expensive to have a study in the studio if you ha want to have the, really the same setup. If you cheat or if you skip times or something like this, you wouldn't have that for sure. Okay, great, thanks. Hi, uh, I would like to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit more regarding the length of time that you'd run a diary study. I think at a certain point you say like 30 days. Oh, usually we do 14 days. 40. Uh, 14. 14. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's heavily depending on what you right. want to achieve. And uh, on the other hand, it's uh, heavily depending on the costs you uh, can spend on it. So I can't give you a rule of thumb to uh, 10 days or do, f do 100 days. It's really depending. Cool. And uh, piggyback to that, what's your drop off rate? As the longer diary studies are, generally there is more likelihood of participants dropping. So if you have a ballpark of your drop off rate, I would love to hear. If, there, if I can assume how many people are going to leave if, if you play longer, if they are asked to play longer, I can't. Within 14 days, usually we have two people dropping. Sometimes we have four people dropping. And I would assume that it's uh, more people the longer the study runs. But as I say, assumptions are leading to failure. So you would have to try yeah. to check out on this. But uh, the longer, the bigger drops, for, for sure. sure. Thank you.
Hi. Uh, hello. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've got several questions. I think the, the first one is. Um, um, I forgot, no, sorry. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the data that you collect and what kind of questions you ask the players? Uh, okay, it's uh, really depending, but uh, we ask for, uh, we have ratings for sure, so how did you enjoy your day? We have this emotion list, which we use all the time. Um, then we really adjusted to the game. So as I showed you the screenshots for Nano Online, it was really important to find out how the people are building and do they get the um, core loop of the game because you have um, a radius around each building and people have to know this because otherwise their economy wouldn't run efficiently. So we made screenshots. With other games, uh, we tested, for instance, Silent Hunter Online, a submarine game, and we looked which torpedoes are used, which submarines are bought. I think there isn't a rule that you can give. I, the only thing that I would stuck to all the time are the emotions, because they're helping really a lot. So if you ask uh, appreciation ratings and emotions and stuff like that, what, how do you treat them if you've got such low sample? such a low amount of players. How we treat the ratings, yeah. I think it's really interesting to see them over time and to see, to see them in relating to the emotions. So if you have uh, three emotions like angry, disappointed and stuff like this, for sure you will see a dip within the rating. And, um, but maybe it was a tech bug, so you can say we had server issues on this day, so we can even it out within our um, averages in the end of the game. So um, set it into relation, and um, then you can see in the development over time. And what you can expect is a dropping, uh, usually you ha will have a dropping uh, rate ratings after day five to day seven. Not significantly, but they will drop usually. Hi there. Um, how do you deal with participants who might be just maybe making up the data? Because obviously you're giving them a lot of trust because they're conducting and writing the study and uh, diary entries in their own time, in their own personal space. So if you're getting very limited information back or, or maybe information that's not useful to you, how do you deal with that? Uh, you can uh, set up your methodology to avoid this. So if you have ratings, people have just to take a question within a survey. Um, the other way is to ping them on some way via email or just in a personal phone call or something like this and ask them again. And to be honest, at some point we have to kick out people because they are not giving decent feedback. How do you find that participating in a diary study affects behavior? Uh, sorry? How does it affect behavior? Because I, mean, I guess you've got, you've got your, your random player, which you know about through telemetry, and then you've got your diary study player. And how does that affect what people do? Or, or do you give them specific tasks? I'm just wondering, um, I guess, how naturalistic the diary study participant is, um, that would depend on what you told them to do, because if you tell them to play for an hour every day and they might not normally do that, then that's... So, <laughs> if I get it right, you ask between the difference on, between on-site tests and diary studies? No, I'm interested, I guess, in the difference between someone who participates in your diary study and someone who's just an ordinary player. I see that question doesn't seem to make yeah, sense yeah, to you. I know. But, mm -hmm. yeah. This is hard to, hard to tell. You can try to adjust it with BI data, so you can see what is the... Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of what I'm asking. Is there anything systematic about that? I would uh, try to align it with BI data, so you can see if uh, you have uh, ratings or stuff like this, you can try to align it with your drop rates and with your um, uh, daily active users and stuff like this. And you get a notion. For sure, we are doing qualitative uh, feedback, so it's not that exact, yes, but uh, you can have... I'm not sure if I was clear. <clears throat> I'm, I'm interested to understand 
how it changes the player's behavior, or, uh, or does how, it? Okay, yeah. how it changes the players. Mm -hmm. uh, so knowing that they are in a diary study. Yeah, yeah, because there's, in a sense, you kind of know that, but I don't know what the answer is, so I'm wondering if you can help. That depends really on the person. We have uh -huh. some people that are feeling like a game tester and that are trying to break the game constantly because they are really happy in finding tech bugs mm -hmm. and sending them back. But we have some people just enjoying the game and we have some people that are like, okay, I have to do this because I agreed upon it and otherwise I won't get my money. But uh, this is something that you can see in, your, in their behavior. So if they are more like uh, copycatting each day and from day five you will get the same report or almost the same report, um, then you see they are not that uh, keen to fulfill the study as it meant to and then you can cut them out. Mm -hmm. So this would be a drop. All the, those are people play to the end and we would pay them but we wouldn't uh, consider the data for the, for the report. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, hi. Um, can I ask you to clarify how you paid the players? Did you pay them per hour or was it one fixed fee for the whole diary study? Um, we asked for a certain amount of time. How much time is that? So it's... Uh, Usually we have uh, games with a daily login, so we ask for a time span of two weeks with at least one hour a day. Or Assassin's Creed Identity was half an hour a day, so it's depending. But we ask for a certain amount of time over a certain period. So but but uh, this is something that we are doing because it fitted to our games. If you want to have uh, people playing a whole way through, let's say you test World of Warcraft, I wouldn't so recommend to ask them just play an hour. And then you have to consider how you pay them because uh, maybe you can do it on an hourly basis because you can track the data. What did you but do? I think this would be, would be a little bit dangerous because people are playing only to get more money. Yeah, that's what I was getting yeah. at really. So you paid, just to be clear, yeah. you paid one yeah. fixed fee at the end for yeah. the whole study. And if you do it like we do it, do it um, you will get overtime by the people, which is, which is good for you or for us. And uh, on top of that, you get a feeling the, or if people are really liking the game because they are playing more than they are paid for, which is an information on top that you can use later on.